Hello? Just checking that everyone can indeed hear me. Welcome back. Welcome back. We are about to move into a question and answer session with a panel of my esteemed MSP colleagues. So please do join me in welcoming Megan Gallagher, MSP from the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, Cocab Stewart, MSP from the Scottish National Party, Rosa Grant, MSP from the Scottish Labour Party, and Beatrice Wishart, MSP from the Scottish Liberal Democratic Party. Now, we have a range of questions um, from across the chamber. We have already several that have been submitted in advance, so I am going to begin, first of all, with a question from Sarah Khalif from Govan High School in Glasgow. Sarah, if you could please raise your hand so we know if you are, where you are. Um, please, if able, do stand and put the question to the panel. Can we have a microphone to Sarah? Hello, my name is Sarah Khalif and my question is about period poverty. The recent legislation about period poverty is the first of its kind in the world and I believe this is a huge step forward for women. It gives access to women to get free period products. Could you tell us how you introduced this legislation and why you waited until 2021 to get this legislation released when period poverty has been affecting women for many decades? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to put that question in the first instance to Rhoda. Um, I worked with colleagues. The colleagues had obviously taken the lead in this, but it was a huge issue that had gone on for far too long. Um, we normally give things free to people that need it, but um, with period poverty. Lots of people were missing out on work and school um, because they didn't have access to period products. So, the, I think the whole parliament came together. This was something that we saw as really important. And it was, I guess, one of those things that very seldom when the whole parliament agrees, it makes the headlines. But because this was groundbreaking, um, it, it actually did make the headlines. And I think it has led legislation in other places as well. So hopefully period products will be free the world over. Thank you, Rhoda. Uh, um, thanks for that question. Um, I got elected in 2021, so I wasn't actually part of uh, the legislation progress of that, um, but I watched it very carefully and uh, welcomed it. You're right to point out that um, you know, issues around period poverty have been around for a long time, and, and you're quite right uh, to point out that maybe it has taken too long, but I think it is worth pointing out that we are the first parliament in the world to have done that, and that is a massive achievement. On visits around Europe uh, that I have been lucky to have, um, they celebrate that fact, and they've highlighted, and they talk about it. Um, so whilst I wasn't part of that, um, I'm delighted that I'm part of that legacy. Thank you. Megan? So I was a, a councillor um, when this was brought in and it was fantastic to see, because it doesn't always happen, that cross-party support was achieved um, for this fantastic piece of legislation that has completely changed um, how women can access period products. I mean, I think now when you go into, it's not just your council buildings or here in the Scottish Parliament, but I mean, actually when you go to bars and restaurants, how heartening is it to see period products there if you need them? Um, so I think it's actually started a further social discussion um, on access to period products and it's excellent to see businesses taking that challenge on and following um, the legislation that's been passed here in the Scottish Parliament so it's, it's fantastic to see and when I was a councillor um, the discussions were taking place in council chambers across the country um, at the same time it was going through here in the Scottish Parliament um, and I think we do need to give some kudos as well to um, one of our colleagues Monica Lennon for kick-starting that conversation because um, it is through women MSPs being here in the Parliament that things like this do happen. So kudos to Monica, but well done every MSP for getting it through this chamber. Thank you, Megan and Beatrice. 
wasn't in Parliament at the time that the process started, but I was a councillor like Megan, and I know it was discussed within the, the council setting that this was a really good thing as we watched what was happening in Parliament. I came into Parliament in uh, autumn 2019, and I had the privilege of being able to vote on all the good work that other colleagues had done. Um, and it is it, the fact that it's groundbreaking that, that Scotland is leading the way. It will make a huge difference to women in, also in lots of other countries as well as Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, for your question. And I think um, colleagues have demonstrated the collegiate approach that has helped pass this legislation. I'm now going to take a question from Rebecca Weimer from North Highland Women's Wellbeing Hub. Rebecca, um, please raise your hand so we know where you are. And if you are able, do please stand and please put your, your question to the panel. Do I need a microphone or can you hear me? Yes, your mic is on. We can I'm loud enough all by myself. Um, so good afternoon. The Women's Health Plan was originally created with women's voices at its core. Could you please explain how you will ensure women's lived experiences will remain embedded in this? Okay, so that is a question. Sorry, I'm not sure if it was wholly clear down here. So would you just like to repeat that? Thank you. Yep. So the Women's Health Plan was originally created with women's voices at its core. Could you please explain how you will ensure women's lived experiences will remain embedded in this? Question on the Women's Health Plan, and I'll go to COCAB. Yes, so uh, we have uh, a minister, uh, Marie Todd, for uh, women's health in particular, which um, I think is also sort of groundbreaking. I think that's the first as well, so that's to be welcomed. And um, I'm aware with uh, conversations with Marie, but also uh, watching the progress of the plan, that um, there was a lived experience survey that was done to sort of underpin everything that was in it. Um, it rolled out, there should be regular check-ins based on that model so that those lived experience voices um, can be at the heart of it um, so we can protect ourselves from the danger of not just measuring data um, because women are women, um, they're not just data sets. So we need to bring the numbers alive by making sure that their voices and their experiences are integral to that but also their changing experiences and opinions as well. Thank you very much. And Megan, on how the Women's Health Plan, well, how we can ensure that women's experiences are key to that. So I think we need to make sure that women are at the centre um, of the, the health plan. I mean, I think when we look at the health plan, there's so many different aspects to it. I mean, there's work around the menopause, there's work to improve maternity services, access to abortion rights. These are all things that are hugely important topics and one that I'm sure every single one of us here today um, will all champion and want to see change in. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, now, there'll be work done through committees, um, as you'll know, and that will be a really important tool, I think, for women to, to feed in their lived experiences through consultation processes. Um, I think also um, it's about about utilising your politicians, so utilising your MSPs. We are a vessel um, because we are the ones that can raise questions on your behalf. We are the ones that can challenge aspects um, to the government, but also um, work in a cross-party basis to make sure that these changes happen. So lived experience is so, so important. And what we need is for every single one of you um, to either write to us, to contact us, take part in the consultations, but be a voice for you and your peers, because it's so important. Change won't happen unless we all band together. Thank you very much. And Beatrice? I think there's a lot of good work that's done through cross-party groups on individual issues. And I think that that's a good place where um, we can hear uh, lived experience, as well as obviously within our own constitu constituencies and hearing directly from people that, uh, in the communities that we, in which we live and work. But it's also up to us when we are here to um, challenge, to question just how much progress is being made and keeping that topic alive. Thank you. And Rhoda? We really have to represent our constituents' views now. Rebecca is from um, Caithness, is, is active in petitioning the Parliament, active in making sure women's issues are heard. And there's a lot of women, indeed, in Caithness, um, who have been badly let down because of women's health services, the centralisation of maternity to Inverness. So 
women have to travel the equivalent of if you lived in Edinburgh, going to Newcastle to have your baby, going to Newcastle in labour if there was complications. That's not really acceptable. So, you know, I've got constituents in the north who are really making will not be, be silenced, will make sure that their voices are heard. And that's what we need, because with the best will in the world, we, you know, we make plans, we do all those things. But it, we depend, as representatives here, on our constituents to keep, keep, our, um, keep us kind of really um, rooted in what's going on in the communities that we represent. And that's our, our job. Um, but also, I, I understand the Health and Social Care Alliance are being charged with some of this consultation and bringing views back to the Parliament, and I think that's good because that is a non-governmental organisation, a third sector or organisation, and they're quite vocal in representing views as well. So, I think people like Rebecca, people like the Alliance, um, will really make sure that this happens because it's a good, good policy, and we need to make sure it delivers. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, panel members. I'd now like to invite Kat Sutherland, who is a retired police inspector, to ask a question. Kat, can you let us know where you are? Ah, there you are. Um, can we? Kat's microphone is on. Women and girls in Scotland experience harassment across all areas of their life, at school, in work, on the street and online. How will you work to ensure that the proposed misogyny bill becomes law? Thank you very much, Kat. I'll put that question to Megan. Well, thank you very much, Kat. And again, you know, I think most women in this room will have experienced misogyny at some point in their life. And I think it's more rife now in terms of the abuse that particularly young women face online, whether it's an attack on um, a young woman's image, on what they see online. It's far harsher um, than what's experienced by our male peers. And it's got to stop. I think that's, that's the bottom line of it. We've got to find a way to tackle it. Um, so the misogyny bill will be... I think an important discussion that we need to have. I think devil's always in the detail um, when it comes to bills, so it'll be about scrutinising um, the piece of, of legislation when it, when it comes through Parliament. But again, this is where voices of everyone matters um, because there will be consultation periods, um, there will be you know, various different ways that people can come and give evidence um, to politicians that are taking part in the committee aspect, but also the ones that will take on the challenge of um, scrutinising the legislation and putting it through Parliament. So again, it will be a hugely important um, topic and, and one that we all really need to take on as a challenge. Thank you. Beatrice? I mean, this is a very collegiate panel because I think that um, we certainly will be working pretty, pretty closely together to make sure that this goes through. I think we all feel quite strongly that it is a piece of legislation that has to go through, um, not just for our age group, but I think as the, um, Grace and Zara, when they spoke earlier very eloquently, I think that it's very clear it's incumbent on us to make sure that that, that legislation goes through for the future. I have, um, I have two granddaughters that are, are, are similar ages, um, and I see how empowered they are compared to either their mothers or me. It's that generational shift and what was accepted but not acceptable 20 years ago or even 40 years ago, I see the need to make sure that this misogyny bill and also the work of Dame Helena Kennedy goes through um, for the future of our young people in Scotland. Thank you. Rhoda? Um, I absolutely agree. And yes, there has been a huge amount of progress, but it almost seems like when we deal with one aspect of misogyny and we think we've got it sorted, another one arises. So every generation almost faces a new wave of it. So I think we need to make sure this bill goes through, but I hope also alongside it there is education because this is not a woman's problem, this is a problem with some men, and we need to get men to address behaviour. We need to, instead of teaching our daughters how to keep them safe, how to dress, how to do all these things. We should actually be teaching our sons how to behave because, you know, we really need to change the aspect of making women responsible to, for this as making men responsible for that. And I hope the bill does go some way to do that. Thank you. And co -cap. 
I'll, I'll just carry on from where you were, Rhoda, on that, um, because uh, I welcome uh, the legislation that will be brought forward, by the way. Um, I, I have no doubt that it's going to be quite complex um, and it will require uh, extensive scrutiny. Um, um, I, I think that there probably will be controversy around it because um, there is always uh, issues about definitions and how we define what comes under uh, the umbrella of misogyny and behaviour and that has often led to lots of debates uh, when we've looked at other legislation around the Equalities Act and uh, protected characteristics. So what I hope that we are not, um, well, I hope we are uh, brave enough to be able to discuss those uh, very difficult and complex issues that are going to arise in this. But whilst legislation can protect us from the worst harms and the excesses of misogynistic abuse, what it won't do is protect us from what we need to do is a cultural change and that cultural change requires every single one of us um, uh, to, to keep that pressure on really so it, you know the, the legislation is essential but it's attitudinal and cultural change that we need to keep enforcing and working away at as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kat. I'd now like to invite Amy Jonesy from Drum Drum Drumchapel High School to ask a question. Amy, can you raise your hand, please, so we know where you are? Ah, uh, Amy. Amy is, is with us here. If we can have Amy's microphone on, do please stand if you're able. Thank you. Today's event has focused on the past 20 years of feminist action in Scotland. What progress would you like to see over the next 20 years for women and girls in Scotland? Well, there's a big question, and I'll put that to Beatrice. I didn't quite catch it, but I think it's is it on the line of where, we, where things will be in 20 years' time. Yeah, Amy was saying, yeah, yeah just really, um, we've got to where we are today, um, following 20 years of hard work. Where would you like to see us? Where do you think we'll be in 20 years' time? Yeah. I mean, we have come a long way, uh, but we've a way to go. <laughs> And uh, it, it is about societal change. What I'd like to see in the future is actually where we actually don't have to sit down here and have these conversations. That's where we need to aim for. We have a way to go. And certainly with all the energy that's in this room, there's no stopping us now. Um, so, so, so yes, there's a, lot, there's a long way to go, but we have actually come a long way. I'm old enough, and as you can tell by the grey hair, I've you know, the last 40 years or so, when I think back to when I was your age, um, we have come an enormous way, and that's because of the work of, like, the, the Women's Convention in the last 20 years. So uh, we need to make sure that we make more progress and um, look to the future where we don't have to have these conversations. Thank you. And Rhoda? absolutely agree success will look like when we don't have to have a Scottish Women's Convention. We don't have to have um, any of the, these things. But, you know, listening earlier to Sarah and Grace, you know, everything that they were looking for is what I would want um, for them. And I think we have to be careful sometimes because as being older, um, I see sometimes young people accept the, the wins of previous generations, of my mother's generation, of uh, generations that came before me, and don't realise that that was a struggle. Um, so I think we have to remember the struggles of the past so that we don't lose sight of what, where we have to go in the future. And I'm confident, because of the young people that spoke today, that we will get there because there's determination there. So um, we can hand that over and hopefully it'll be sorted before, for your children, if not for you. Cool cab. Thank you. Um, as I look out across this chamber and I see women um, of all ages and representatives of probably every aspect of society, but for me in particular, um, it resonates um, of all the women in colour that are of colour that are in this chamber as well. And um, I, I can't not have this opportunity to sort of point out the fact that um, in 2021, um, I mean, it, it happened to be me, but I'm just glad that it was somebody, um, a woman of colour was elected for the first time to this place. Um, so that was an achievement that um, was, yes, I mean, it was great, but also with regret that it actually took 20 years for that to happen. 
Um, so I suppose I'm relating back to, I, I listen very, um, with great interest to uh, Dr. Govinda and what she was saying about intersectionality. So um, absolutely celebrating the successes and we've come a long way, we've made great progress. But there are some parts of that intersectionality that haven't made that progress. So what I would like to see, that's part, you know, part of my work and something that's built in me, is to make sure that all those intersectionalities and you know, women of disabilities, of different colours, of different class um, and caste, um, are actually brought along at the same time and you know it's not one of these graphs where different people are different women are progressing at different levels so that's what I would like to see happening and Megan well I hope that in 20 years time some of you have been sitting here today will actually have taken part in these panels because that will continue on the conversation um, so I really hope that that happens um, but if I could just throw out some statistics in terms of you know where we are just now um, about 11 percent um, that's how much of a wage less that we are paid than our male peers only 4% of women sit at the top of top of business jobs. So we've got a lot of work to do. We've got some way to go um, in order to, to, to make vast improvements. So in 20 years' time, I want to see that ceiling smashed. Um, and it's got to be smashed because we've got to have more women at the top jobs, whether it's in business. Um, we've been talking about a little bit about uh, renewables today. Um, you know, that's going to be a huge um, discussion as we move forward to try and achieve our net zero goals. So this is where, you know, we as women really need to take a stand and make sure that we can achieve those top jobs because I don't see why we can't. We've got talent you know, in this room here um, you know, that, that mirrors um, our male peers and I'm not trying to say that our male peers should not have those jobs as well but there has to be a balance as we've spoken about um, so frequently today. So that, that's where I would like to see us in 20 years. But if I can just go on a personal level, um, I gave birth to my daughter Charlotte in um, July last year. Um, so in 20 years' time, Charlotte will be 20, nearly 21, and I want to make sure that Scotland's a far better place for her to grow up than what it is just now. We have made excellent progress, but we've got some way to go. So I'm hopeful um, that the discussions that we've had today will keep the momentum going so the, the changes that we make here in this, this Parliament will benefit each and every one of you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, we do have time in hand, and it's probably, well, I don't know, have I ever been able to say that before in the Chamber, colleagues? Um, and I think that's because um, my colleagues have answered the questions comprehensively and succinctly at the same time. So please do put up your hand if you have a question, and we'll put it to the panel. Who would like to ask a question? Okay, please do. Um, can we have a, a microphone down here? Oh, sorry. There, so we're going to take a question up there, and then can we have a microphone down here, please, too? So we'll take take yourself first. Thank you. Since, oh, I'm going to go up here as there is a microphone, and then we'll make sure you're on. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, panel. Good afternoon, everyone. My question is about domestic violence in Scotland affecting African women. We are referred to women's aid without thinking about the cultural taboo that affects us. We don't get access to the services that we need because the women's aid does not understand the cultural impact of domestic violence. How do we break the bias so that African women will be getting the same kind of attention when they are suffering domestic violence by providing clear understanding either to the women's aid or allowing the women's aid to welcome working with other organizations, like our organization, my charity. I'm a domestic violence advocate. I've got 23 years experience. I survived and I'm thriving. But there are more women who are unable to thrive. Like um, the first minister said earlier, that there are many women who could be entrepreneurs. Some of us are limited because we can't do it. We don't get the help that you know, is required basically because we have the cultural background of DV and also because we are limited by immigration status. Now, how can the Scottish government, this parliament, help the African woman to thrive after domestic violence? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to put, I know it's a question about what the government in particular can do, but um, my colleagues can certainly speak as, as parliamentarians and I'm going to put that question first of all to Rhoda. It's quite sad that we're still 
dealing with domestic violence because it was one of the things that this Parliament did in the very early stages was legislate on domestic violence and we still have a long, long way to go. We also have to shape services for people and I think that's really what your I couldn't hear your question totally. The, kind of, the acoustics down here are not great, but I, as I understand you're saying that services are not always shaped um, to deal with issues within different communities. And I think we have to look at that to make sure that the services are there. And I know Women's Aid do work on that, but we have to um, work with them and organisations such as the one you're having. Now, there are issues about people who don't have access to public resources, um, and we need to sort that because we actually make people more vulnerable by not protecting them and then people fall into the wrong hands looking for help and support in desperation and that's totally wrong so we need to do something about that to make sure that people don't, who don't have access to public resources get the same help as others. Co-Cab. Thank you. Um, you're, you're right to raise um, the, the point and I've always thought that there, there is a disparity and that's back to the intersectionality of it um, and Whilst we as women can come together and we have much in common, we are all individuals as well and we also have our own little groups. You know, there's many, many labels, there's many, many little groups that we all belong to and all of those uh, should be treated with equal value. Um, and from that point of view, when you're providing services, I do believe that those services should be culturally sensitive. And we do have a history of that. It's absolutely could be improved and further investment and encouragement of that needs to be required and I'll certainly do my best well I'll continue to do my best to press for that um, the the equalities minister knows fine well how vocal I am on these issues um, but to also mention the work of um, Shakti Women's Aid for instance now um, that has been around for decades and decades and does amazing work there there's also the Amina Women's Centre um, as well in Glasgow so there are groups um, but but you're right to highlight the gap that is there for uh, women of African origin. You're right to do that. Megan? Um, if I can continue on the, the conversation, because I've agreed um, with everything so far, there does need to be a cultural shift to make sure that we're inclusive for everybody um, and everyone can get signposted to, to the help and support that they need when required. Um, in terms of the, the domestic violence aspect um, that's, been, um, that's been raised, um, my colleague Pam Gossel, MSP, um, who's also another woman of colour, which is fantastic to see, um, and the, the Scottish Parliament is taking through um, a domestic abuse register Bill. Um, it's still very much in its inf uh, infamous inf my goodness, <laughs> infancy, thank you. Um, it's still very much in its infancy, um, but um, the, the consultation period finished um, roughly towards the end of last year, so hopefully um, we'll be able to achieve, again, cross-party support for that, because, again, that's about tackling um, the issue of domestic violence, and, and I'm sure with, with Pam and Pam's um, knowledge um, across this, this area um, that she'll have all groups in society um, at our heart of this bill, so hopefully um, you'll see more about this. Um, travelling through the Parliament in due course. And Beatrice? It's obviously about in, inequity of, of access to, to, to services and, and the issue around um, recourse to public funds, which uh, I know other colleagues are very active on. Um, and uh, I, I, can, I can speak for what I've seen uh, in, in Shet like Shetland's Women's Aid uh, and actually, can I give them a shout out because they're 40 years old this week um, and they've done fantastic work uh, in, in the island. And, and again, it's, it's that issue of saying, actually, we shouldn't need them. There, there should be, but I'm glad they're there. Um, um, but getting back to your, your question, it's about designing services that meet the needs of everybody. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think I'll just leave it there because I think everybody's covered the other points. Thank you very much. I'm going to finish on this one question. We have time for the one question. I'm going to, to go to yourself. Thank you. Oh, uh, thanks. Um, this is a question that's a bit similar to the last one. Um, I'm a recently elected PI coordinator for Area 11 Allen on um, in Scotland. 
Um, um, and in case you don't know, about 95% of those attending Al-Anon family groups in Scotland are women. Um, obviously, Al-Anon is a free um, support. Um, and I think prior to the pandemic, there was a, a parliamentary group uh, working with those um, within Al-Anon. So I would like to know if, if this parliament are um, happy to reinstate that dialogue um, to raise awareness of the support that Al-Anon family groups can offer women across Scotland. Okay, thank you. Um, CoCab? Just I could pick up I the name of the group. I'm sorry, I was trying to catch it. Anon. Oops. Who have been affected by alcoholism in the family? Ah, yes, right. Sorry, sorry. Forgive me. I was wanting to make sure that. Um, um, yes. So, cross-party groups um, are um, a very uh, effective way of um, providing those spaces. I mean, it, it's new to me, and I'm sort of um, on some cross-party groups and a convener of uh, one as well. And um, it's a really valuable opportunity for people to sit around that table and to speak to parliamentarians and those that are in decision making sort of um, areas to put those views forward, but in a less sort of adversarial way. Um, and I would certainly uh, be you know, up for encouraging that. Um, I've spoken previously on um, the way that alcohol um, sort of um, affects children, I suppose, not, uh, well, con con consuming it, but also um, alcoholism and living with that and sort of uh, all of those effects. Uh, so, yes, I, I would be happy to, you know, please do get in touch. I'd be happy to take that up. <laughs> and Megan? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, when you're, you're looking at um, concerns such as alcoholism, um, it's one, you know, that, that we as, as parliamentarians either discuss, talk about or receive into our inbox in, in, in a, a, a regular occurrence. Um, and I think, you know, we've had various different debates, you know, picking up on um, what COCAB was saying. Um, we had a debate um, on FASD, for example, which is another, um, it's another um, example of where we've had these discussions. I wasn't aware of the last cross-party group because I wasn't elected at that that point in time, but certainly, um, as COCAB said, you know, cross-party groups are very effective um, in terms of you know, coming up with either you know, policy ideas um, or discussion in terms of how we can make changes to benefit people, uh, particularly families that are dealing with, with, with this huge issue, and let's face it, it is a huge issue in Scotland. Um, so as COCAB said, just to finish, um, get in touch. Um, if you get in touch, then MSPs can come together um, and hopefully set that back up for you. Beatrice? I think uh, cross-party groups are, are, are very effective. If I think back to the report that came out this, uh, earlier this week, um, and the cross-party group on poverty, uh, led by Pam Duncan Glancy, and that was looking at, at stigma issues around uh, poverty, a really comprehensive report, and that was all led by the information that was fed in by people attending the cross-party group, which can be done remotely now, of course, as well, which makes it more accessible. Um, so I do think it's an effective way of, of, of getting issues out in, the, out in the public domain and bringing it to the attention of parliamentarians. And Rhoda? Um, yes, I, I agree with what everybody said. There are other ways, of course, of informing MSPs. We've got things like members' debates. So if you can get an MSP to sponsor a motion for a members' debate, we can raise that in the Parliament here. And also roundtable events. It doesn't necessarily have to be a cross-party group. We can have roundtable events for MSPs to come and hear about issues and people speak. But I was struck, I think, you, and I didn't hear the statistics properly, but you, you were, I think, saying that it was mostly women that were involved with Al-Anon and needing... 95% of those attending Al-Anon family groups are women. OK. And that kind of shows you, you know, we're not saying that all people with alcoholic issues are men, but it shows you the disparity of women, especially things like the gender pay gap, where the impact of a partner's alcoholism is much greater on women than it is on men. So it, it just shows you in the round how difficult all of that is. And when people are dependent on people who have issues, they need support. And, you know, Al-Anon does a great job providing that support. 
Thank you very much. Um, regrettably, um, because we're out of time, we're going to have to leave this session here. I feel next year we should let this you know, be at least, at least an hour. Um, thank you all very much indeed for your very pertinent questions, and I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking our panellists this afternoon. Okay, just bear with me one moment. So, thank you all. I would now like to introduce our final speaker this afternoon, Susan Morrison. Susan is a writer, a broadcaster and a comedian. She has been an MC at the Stand Comedy Club in Edinburgh and has taken to the stage many times on many occasions in many venues. We're very fortunate to have her with us this afternoon. Susan is passionate about history. She's the host of BBC Scotland's radio history magazine programme, Time Travels in Scotland, where she loves to bring to light the achievements of the incredible women in our past who have often been written out of the story. Susan. Um, I was about to start telling Grace and Zara about some of the great women in Scotland's history, but then I realised, oh, shit, she's... Oh, sh I'm sorry. <laughs> They're talking about me, so I'd better get up and do something. Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Susan Morrison, as the presenting officer has just reminded me, so that's useful. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here today. I decided um, I was going to do the statewomanly thing. And I was going to write a speech, Agnes, every word beautifully crafted, every word, children, Grace, Zara, every word. So this morning I decided I would print it before I came out. But this is the tale of a woman's lived experience. So I got up and I realised, that's a nice day, I could get a wash in it. <laughs> Hands up, who else thought that? <laughs> yeah, right, hi. So I did hen. Right, so I got the washing out, right, and I'm thinking, that's handy, that's fine, that's fine. Oh, geez, well, the cat's been sick, so I had to clean that up, right? Uh, my son had left something on the landing, so I tripped over that, that had to get cleared up, you know what I'm saying? So I'd say, right, 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 I've got to turn up the Scottish Parliament, I've got to look, I had a shower, right, got to soap my eyes, as you imagine. Uh, then I decided I would print out, uh, the speech went back downstairs, finished doing the washing up, grabbed the speech, ran out the door, right, and here I am. This is the first page of a letter of complaint to British Rail, <laughs> who no longer exist, so God knows why I'm writing to them. And this is a recipe involving turnip, <laughs> which is quite handy because it might be the only thing we've got to eat in the future. And uh, actually, it's quite good. I'm going to keep that. So that is the lived experience, young ladies, young, my young sisters. That's what women are like. It's just like a woman's life you will find out as you go through life. Just basically a woman's life turns into trying to sell a tape jellyfish to the beach. <laughs> you know, you're constantly doing it and you can't really remember why, but you have to keep going. And every now and again you succeed and there's nobody there to see it. But so we're just going to have to wing it. Is that OK with you guys? Right. <laughs> Right, okay, so I've got 10 minutes, let's go. Okay, so the first thing that I always, International Women's Day always reminds me is the fact that the Russian Revolution was actually started by women on International Women's Day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we can, all get, we can all start arguing about how successful the Russian Revolution actually was, but let's not go there right now. Um, it was women in St. Petersburg. It was 1917. It was the height of the Russia's activity in the First World War. The women were starving. More than that, the children were starving. Do not get in the way of a woman whose children is starving. These women took to the streets, shoulder to shoulder. They took on the Russian army, which, to be honest with you, was not that good, but let's not go there either, okay? The Russian army was armed. These men were armed. But these women stood shoulder to shoulder and said, no, or whatever it is in Russian. <laughs> they, they were fired upon young sisters, but they still didn't stop. They still didn't stop. They tore in to those lads, and God help them. 
and I've probably given a right belter in the air and sent them back to the rain mummies. And then they broke into the granaries and they fed their children. And from that point, the Russian Revolution spread throughout Tsarist Russia with incredible speed. So it all came from angry women. And that's part of the point that I'm wanting to make today is the fact, and the First Minister alluded to this, anger it can be pointless, but rage is great. <laughs> anger, anger is when you just go, what? Why does nobody empty the dishwasher, right? But rage can fuel you and power you on. And that's what happened with these women. And this is why I think, and I'm looking around this room, I'm looking around this chamber, it's magnificent. And I think that this is why men are afraid of women when they gather and talk. <laughs> this is why they feared the covens. It wasn't because of what we could do with the toad, although that was quite handy. It wasn't because of the way that we could curse, it was the fact that they were talking. And when I was coming to the parliament today and I was coming down the high street, you were all coming down from all parts of the city. You were coming out, they were coming off buses and you came up from trains and I could hear you all. And then I came into the parliament and the noise was amazing. You cannot have three women standing in an enclosed space without conversation starting. I mean, how many of us have, how many of us have been in a lift with, I? With one woman, and by the time you get out on the eleventh floor, you know that her niece's IVF didn't work out very well. But they've got really high hopes <laughs> this time. It's going to be absolutely fine, and you're away thinking, "Well, that's good. because women talk. Women talk. That's what led those Russian women to rise. They were talking. That's what led those women in the past being hounded and, and, and uh, accused of witchcraft because they were talking. They were daring to talk. And when women dare to talk, it's a frightening thing for those who want to keep us down, which is why we should keep talking. And why, incidentally, they're trying to kind of stop us from talking. Misogyny is having a great old day in the sun right now, but we'll fight. We'll be back. Don't worry. But what it's doing is it's going into your heads through social media. It's much cleverer than it used to be. It used to be just men shouting, you're going, oh, hen, what you up to? <laughs> that. Although, to be fair, in Glasgow, that was a good chat of line, so, you know. <laughs> Don't you tell him. Where are you going, hen? Um, and, but now, now they, can get, they can reach right into it in a way that they couldn't do with us. They can reach in to your mind. So please be aware of the fact that they're trying to isolate you. But keep talking. Keep that rage going. And then you were talking, and I'm sorry, I've got to say this uh, to Grace and to Zara, and it's like, happy birthday to the SWC, 20th birthday, fantastic, which is why you were casting forward into 20 years. Sweetheart, children, 20 years is that. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, how many of us are looking in the mirror going, what the f... <laughs> <laughs> Who is that woman? <laughs> It's worse than that. I look in the mirror and think, why is my dad in drag? <laughs> it goes like that. Enjoy every minute, right? Enjoy every single minute. Because you'll only be, what, in your 30s or something like that? You wouldn't even be in mold that, would you? Would you? Bitches. <laughs> Of course I'm jealous. Of course I'm jealous. Look at you. You've got all, oh, you've got so much ahead of you. But you've got so many battles to fight. But it'll be great. Battles are great fun, by the way. I mean, make sure that you've got good comrades standing beside you and you'll have an absolutely fantastic time. Get into issues. Really mix it up. Really tear it up, youngsters. Really get into the issues. When you get involved in issues, right, you don't, you find that it comes out of your own head. You start to look around you. You don't get so self-obsessed. When I was a young woman, I was more obsessed with the missile gap than the thigh gap. And... That turned out to be a good thing in the long run, right? Although, you know, I, I, I probably I could have gone on a diet. My mum said I should have gone on a diet, but I didn't listen. Get involved with other people. It will so em empower your life. Make sure you stand shoulder to shoulder with good comrades, good friends. You'll find them. Don't you worry. They'll be out there. We are here. The mad old bats. We're here. We're absolutely fucking everywhere. You'll find us everywhere. We are the sort of mad old women that go up to people at stations going, you shouldn't be doing that, son. And the great thing is, as we get older, we get listened to. And I know there are people who say that as women get older, they get invisible. They don't, actually. That's why we have to solve all the crimes. Look at Miss Marple. They couldn't get anywhere without her. <laughs> as you get older, as you get older, right, eventually you get to the point where zero foot... Uh, where you don't... I'm sorry, I'm, I was about to swear there, but I'd stop myself. Did you notice that? Well done, mate. <laughs> as you get older, you realise you don't give a damn, right? You do, <laughs> our MSP's going, you are so right. You don't give a damn. You don't care. Okay, so I look like this. What's the problem? If I was going to teach you something, it would be this. So what? 
right? That attitude, so what? I don't care, right, what you think of me. So what? I'm going to do what I want in my life, and I know that you will. But then again, what kind of a world is it you're going to go into? What kind of a world is it you're going to build in that, that glorious 20 years? I won't be here. By the time you're my age, I'll be dead. Be, honestly, because it'd be a bit weird if I wasn't. I mean, I'd be like 100 and something or another. But let me tell you about the the values that we live with just now have to be changed. We've mentioned it several times. We need to culturally change the actual water that we swim in. And we live in a culture that's overwhelmingly dominated by male values. And by this, I'm afraid, right at the very bottom, we're looking at the values of violence, the, viol the, the values of warfare. Have you ever thought it's a bit weird, incidentally, that, you know, Remembrance Day, when we remember the millions and millions of young men who perished far from home for reasons that sometimes they couldn't understand. And for some reason, we commemorate that with fly pass, gunfire, people shooting rifles, people marching past in uniforms, when we should be reaching forward to those uniforms and say, take them off. There's no reason to fight if we talk to each other. And we never thought about that. The values, the values that we need are the ones that are undervalued. And the weirdest thing that's already been mentioned today is those very values are the values of women. And it's the values of caring. Caring is, 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 is what we do. And yet we're discouraged from doing it. But let me explain how valuable that is. So in 2020, I was diagnosed with bowel cancer. And uh, it then uh, it spread. It spread to my liver and to my lungs. So in five years, in, in two years, I had five major operations. Uh, one more, and I would have got a free cappuccino from Starbucks. <laughs> five huge operations, including a double mastectomy. Now, I know what you're thinking. How come she's getting a double mastectomy if she had bowel cancer? Somebody's paperwork was certainly on the printer that day, wasn't it? <laughs> it was because I already had breast cancer. So I came through this, this experience overwhelmingly with women by my side. The nurses who cared for me, the counsellors who came and had a chat with me, the consultants who carried out the surgery, uh, on one occasion was a woman. The consultant who looks after me now is a woman. What I find fascinating is the female consultants, the male consultants are all, hello. I'm Mr. Smith, and I'm Mr. Jones, and I'm Mr. One of them is, is something like Philip G. Martin or something like that. And I said to him, does the G stand for God? And he said, no. <laughs> but it should. <laughs> Tells you a lot about men there, doesn't it, sweetheart? All the male specialists, all the female consultants are Janet, Lorna, Louise, Leslie, and they all talk to me just like that. And one night, um, cancer's a, a real fuck up. Oh, I've said it. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. And one night, I just began to cry uncontrollably on the ward, and the nurse came and she sat with me and she held my hand for oh, as long as it took, as long as it took. And this night, just sit there, just cry my heart. And um, then, and it was a long time, a lot of crying. And then she said, um, are you feeling better? I said, yeah, I'm feeling all right now. And she said, and don't forget, oh, she'd been, she held my hand all that time. And she said, would you like a wee cup of tea? Which, as we all know, is what the NHS is actually fueled on. There's, <laughs> there's a lake somewhere just full of tea. I, I don't know. And she said, would you like a wee cup of tea? And I went, yeah, I think that's great. And she just went like this and produced a cup of tea, and I thought, how? Where did that come from? They must have some tube or something that goes in. But she, and I thought, it's, it's caring. It's that caring. But this is the future that we want you, we want for you. We want you to turn your back on, on the, that, those male values of violence and aggression. We want you to look instead for the caring, for the kindness, for how can you make life better for the people around you. That's how you will improve this planet. That's how we will all get through this. That's how we'll survive. Because I don't think we'll survive much longer you know, if we keep depending on that male aggression that they constantly do. And, um, so the hands fascinate me. Women's hands are amazing. 
Look at the hands when you're next on a train and, and you see an old woman. Just look, look at the hands. Think of the care that those hands. Look at your young hands. What are they going to do? So just astonishing. So just look at those hands. Look at your own hands right now. Just look at them right now. Just look at your hands. Look at that. And just think to yourself, where, where have they been? Where can they go? What will they do? Whose other hand will they hold? It will be caring. And I know there are, gra- there are glass ceilings for you girls to smash through. Okay? But you're all diamonds. What can diamond do? Smash glass. So you shine on diamond girls because you are going to have such a great time out there in the world. It won't be easy. Pick good pals. Make sure you pick good battles. As old comrades, we'll be right behind you, barking me in the background, going, I wasn't like this in my young day, you know. <laughs> but don't worry, we are right behind you. So, sisters, comrades, uh, first of all, I suppose I, I have to tell you something, which is that my last cancer scan was clear. So, but, but finally and I've done this before and I did, I'm going to do it again remember what I said about hands, reach out, just reach out all of you, hold hands with the woman next to you hold hands even if you can it's alright Agnes, you've got her hand lift your hands now look at each other can anything stop us? no! Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much indeed. I would now like to ask Agnes Tolmey to give her closing remarks. Well, um, I don't want to keep you for your drink, so I better rattle through this. Um, First of all, uh, I want to thank all our speakers today. Um, The First Minister, I already thanked her, and I want to thank you presiding officer for facilitating this and allowing this mob in here. (laughs) But Grace and Zara, you were absolutely fantastic. I know you were nervous, but my God, you blew it out the park. You were absolutely amazing. So well done. That was a, a really, really informative and a really amazing uh, a, a contribution you made. And I, I need to learn more. I feel that you're going to give me books for my holidays, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and all the people that took part in our International Women's Day video and also our MSPs who put their neck in the line coming before this audience. They've normally got their back to them. Um, Beatrice, Colcab, and thank you for the um, cricket bat. I got it delivered, thank you. Uh, Colcab, Megan Gallagher, and Rhoda Grant, my friend Rhoda, I've known for a long time. So pleased to see you. Susan Morrison, what can we say? Eh? So what? I think my one when I was growing up, so what, so what? The one I had when I was growing up was make me. Well, make me. Make me. No, I'm not doing it. Make me. (laughs) But that was really, really... um, And I know that was a very brave contribution you made. And I think on behalf of everyone here and everyone who knows you across the movement, we are so glad to know that you are well. So welcome. (laughs) Right, I want to say a couple of thanks to sort of individuals and so, but one of the things I want to say is I want to thank our fantastic sponsors, people, uh, women, mostly women actually across Scotland. We received an overwhelming support from women who own their own Scottish-owned businesses as well as social enterprises based in Bowness and Glasgow and so on and I want to do a particular shout out to Kathleen from C. Nicol who made these beautiful bags she, uh, she couldn't be with us because she had the Covid so I hope you have managed to join us online Kathleen 
the Parliament team and Donald, who is behind me here, and Sutherland for size. I want to thank them because they help us put all this together and make it happen. Uh, there are stalls in the garden lobby. If you haven't visited them, see if you can. The Parliament broadcasting team, you will be able to next, tomorrow or the next day, this will, you'll be able to get this online. So if you want to show it to your mammy girls, you just do that, right? Because mammies will want to know. The catering staff, we want to thank them for supervising the lunch and the reception at the end of the event, which was sponsored by Thompson Solicitors, as ever each year. So thank you for that. I want to thank all of you for making the journey here especially those that came on those buses for Glasgow. I haven't found out who did the singing in the back or the front or what yet, but I'll make that effort over the break. Volunteers. Uh, what can I say? Volunteers and the board members of the Scottish Women's Convention, you're absolutely fantastic and hardworking and an absolute treasure. Uh, to spend time with. The, the goodie bags do take forever to, to go out and source the it items and get on your knees, my knees are cut when you're begging people to give you stuff. Those ca By the way, those camel wafers are getting more and more harder to get every year, but leave it with us. The, but you get the goodie bags, you make them up, you bring them on, and then you take people back to Glasgow on the buses after they've had done some wine. Now, I, I decline to even go there, but you enjoy yourself. But I really do want, if I've missed anybody, can you forgive me because it's been a long day um, and I've not done eat yet. And so that I, I have to say this, I do say it every year, but this year in particular, because it's, it's the first big one we've had since pre-COVID and a whole new team that we only had last year. There's three of them. And that's Susan, Jenna and Ailey. Can you stand up, please? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you can tell people they're appreciated. And it uh, doesn't matter. There's still some people don't feel, I don't know where, uh, because they're tense or the pressurised on these events, but these three have been absolutely superb and we're very, very lucky to have them. Now, as we move into the garden lobby, Christina McKelvey, a long, long and dear friend, uh, MSP Minister for Equalities and Older People will say a few words. Laura Connor from Thompson's will say a few words. And Suzanne Bonner is going to sing for us. Um, but you'll be getting your wine. Get your wine in you first, right? Uh, <laughs> and as I said, Thompson's have sponsored us. I've got nothing left to say, and you might even gather I was felt a bit emotional today, I really did. Um, and it's great having everybody back again after all this time. And I think we can confirm we're back here next year. We are indeed. We're back here next year. <laughs> so you book your seat early. And if you want an aisle seat, you really let, you let us know early as well. Well, thank you for your attendance. It's been absolutely a privilege to spend time with all, each and every one of you. And I'm so pleased we had so many of the young team for Glasgow. <laughs> Got to get my own back in these Edinburgh people. Eh? <laughs> oh, and one, one more shout out before I go. Pauline Rourke is up there, is chairing the STUC Congress this year in, in Dundee. A fabulous woman and a fabulous supporter of us. So that's me. Enjoy your drink. Bye. Thank you, Agnes. That concludes the chamber proceedings of today's events. And I, I think, um, you know, I'm sure I speak for, for each and every one of us here when I say it's just underlined to the importance of this event. And I know that colleagues will rightly, you know, we will continue to campaign and work till we get to a stage where we don't need to have this event. But that being said, I think we need to find another reason to always come together and have well, just such a memorable, fun, moving, emotional 
and important gatherings. So just want to thank each and every individual who has contributed in any way and thank you all for making the effort to come here and be in your parliament today. And I have to say, I really kind of fancy the sound of those buses from Glasgow and the singing. So even though I live in Edinburgh, you might find me on one later. Anyway, I will see you soon in the garden lobby. Take care. Thank you.